Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. God bless all of you who are present. To those of you online, good evening. We are happy to have you here. We're about to push right on into our um, lesson. You know, we are still moving through the area of what? Spiritual Spirit gifts. Spiritual gifts. We'll be there for some time. So as I get set up, let us open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today, the many blessings you have already bestowed upon us, how gracious you have been to your people. Now, Lord, we pray that as we enter the study of God, that you would bless our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would um, allow us to just realize that there's a joy in knowing our God and in submitting to you. So thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I was going to hold off, but, and I'm still going to hold off, about the subject we were talking about briefly at the end of our class but before I do hold off, I do want to ask, is there any questions that absolutely have to be asked? We will spend some time later on uh, dealing with the whole issue of women in the church. I know that's a controversial subject. As you know, I'm not a stranger to controversy. So we will spend some time later this year dealing with that subject. We have dealt with this several times in the past, uh, but many of those who were present have uh, left us one way or the other. And um, I realize that every now and then you must come back and cover some information that you have already covered. I know it's a very touchy subject because we are looking at things now from a different perspective than the way things were looked at 100 years ago or 50 years ago, and in some respects, even 25 years ago. But when we do cover that, we're going to cover it from the perspective of what scriptures say and how I believe we can apply it for today. So. If there's no real burning questions concerning that, we're going to move on. But if you have some questions, those of you online, that need to be answered, we ask that you please email us and uh, we will uh, submit you an answer and let you know that we will go more in depth when the time comes. All right, so go back to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and um, verse number 11. And I'm going to ask um, Deacon Lee, would he read that? Yes, sir. Ephesians 4. Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor and teacher. All right. We have talked about the apostles. Legally, I need one. Let me see my set of notes. We have talked about the apostles. We have talked about the prophet, and we've talked about the evangelist. Now we're going to spend some time talking about the pastor slash teacher. Once again, these were gifted men that God gave to the church. These were the ones that he left in order to guide the church as it relates to the word of God. So, 
The apostles and prophets, we, we saw that from what I believe scripture is teaching and what many others believe scripture is teaching, that those two gifts were there in the formative years of the church. Once again, I know many people believe they are still present today. But it seems like scripture indicates they were there for the formative years. They were part of the foundation. And since we are no longer in the foundation, it seems like those two gifts God is not using during this present time. The gifts that he is using as it relates to these individuals was evangelist and pastor slash teacher. So, what is a pastor? Well, this is about the only place in scripture that you will find the word pastor. It is used a couple other times, but normally it's translated shepherd. Uh, pastor is actually a Latin name that they use. The actual name or the actual word means shepherd. He has given shepherd slash teachers because a pastor and a shepherd is basically, well, not basically, it is the same thing and it is the shepherding that is what we are familiar with and we have come to know. The Bible speaks a lot about shepherding. And we're going to delve into it just a minute here. Let me give you a, some definitions. Now, I have some more information that, and I didn't get this online. I will make sure that it gets online. But what I already have was literally a person who herds sheep can refer by extension to various kinds of leaders, including a church leader who protects church members from danger, feeds their souls, and keep them within the safekeeping of Christ's dominion and reign. Mm -hmm. That's one good definition of a shepherd. It goes on to say, it literally indicates a person whose occupation is to be responsible for his own or another flock of sheep. Leaders are often metaphorically referred to as shepherds of those they are responsible for. All right? Now, before we begin to, let's just quickly go to Hebrews 13 chapter. Because I think this is very important for people to understand. If you have a shepherd, then you have a gift from God. Every congregation that has a shepherd has a gift from God. And literally, we know it is more than one shepherd, generally, in a congregation. But let's go to the book of Hebrews, 13th chapter. And it's the 17th verse. And I'm going to ask someone, either Deacon Lee or someone else who want to want to jump in. I want it read. Pastor, I have it. Okay, go ahead. Hebrews 13, chapter, I mean, verse 17, it says, yes. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. All right. That sounds so good, I'm going to have somebody else read it. <laughs> Yes. Take take your mask and go ahead and get. Uh, Hebrews thirteen verse seventeen. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. All right. Amen. Do I have to?
to have it read again? <laughs> now, why am I reading it? Because it's very difficult for many in churches today, especially in Western congregations, to understand the value of a shepherd. Because we come from a framework in our society of being democratic, we feel that the church should function from a democratic framework. What we fail to understand is that God has never been democratic. He is what we would call a benevolent dictator. God doesn't give us a choice on if we can obey his commandments or not. Now, we take the choice, but he doesn't give it to us. He says, if you do this, blessings come. If you don't do this, then you are going to face some sense of unpleasurable circumstances. He doesn't come to us and say, what would you like to do? And he doesn't come and really say, who would you like to have as your leaders. He basically says that this is what I am going to do and these are the people who I'm going to use. Now, this is not on it, but I think it's good for us to move to that this next passage, Jeremiah 315. Jeremiah 315? I, yes. Jeremiah 315, it says, Then I will give you a shepherd after my own heart, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. All right. God says he will give you and I a shepherd. He actually chooses the individual who he desires. He chooses the individual's plural that he desires to lead his people. That is the way he's always done it. Our Western mindset generally at times rebel against that. And we want to choose our own leaders to lead us. The problem is God chooses leaders who have a heart after him. And oftentimes, we choose leaders who we feel are brilliant, who are tremendous communicators, who may be tall, uh, 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 dark and handsome, uh, uh, or short, stubby, and we like to choose our own leaders. God says, I will choose them. And he says that if you have one that I have chosen, it's a gift to you. That's the whole concept of Ephesians 4. He gave gifts to the church. He gave these individuals to lead his people. So Hebrews says, some people say obey, some people say have confidence, choose whatever word you like. Submit. Because it says submit in there. What he says is that these people who I've given will give an account for your stewardship under their ministry. In other words, North Richmond, <laughs> I'm gonna have to stand yes, and tell the truth about you when I see him in heaven. That's what I'm gonna have to do. And trust me, we'll all be changed. I won't be able to deviate one iota from the truth that I know concerning you. I must give an account then, I must give an account now. That's why I try to keep our congregation and others in prayer. I have to give an account. Now I have to give account now because he goes on to say at the end of that passage, what? Submit to them because if you don't, it's not profitable for you. Not for me. 
I have to be like Ezekiel and tell the truth. As long as I tell the truth, regardless of how hard it is, God is not going to hold me accountable. If I deviate from the truth, he's going to hold me accountable. I have to tell him what I know about you. And he says, if you are rebellious, then it's not going to be profitable that you have a shepherd that God has given you for your soul, for your benefit, for your time down here on earth. So, that's why I say if God has given you a shepherd, you have a great gift. And every congregation that desires one, and I'm talking about a shepherd leader, and like I said, there may be others in the congregation, okay, who are have the gift and help the key leader exercise that. But if God gives that to a congregation, it's a gift. That's why it's important to let God choose the leader and send the one he has already picked out for you. Because you want that person to be a shepherd, to be a pastor. Now, what are some of the things we know about? Well, we read Ephesians 4, Matthew 9, 36. What does that say? Anybody want to turn to it? Matthew 9, 36. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Aha. Uh -huh. You find that same concept in Mark 6, 34. He... Jesus had compassion on the people. Why? Because they were like a sheep. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And the idea of that is sheep will not last without a shepherd. Okay? They need a shepherd. Now we know that the Bible says that Christ is the shepherd of what? All of our souls. Then he give physical shepherds, literal shepherds down here to help his people in the direction that they need to go. And we're going to see some of the things that a shepherd do. Now, what I want to impress to some, and I even like for different, different those who I teach in different ministerial situations, is that notice it says shepherd teacher. We emphasize the teaching aspect, and we're going to get to that. Not today, maybe next week. We, we emphasize the teaching aspect often. But notice, the first thing it talks about is being a shepherd. I can tell you I have seen some tremendous shepherds. They may not have been the best teachers because they may not have had and education. There was a point in time we know as a community of people that we did not have the ability or were not allowed to go and get an education. So many of our pastors may have only had a second or third degree education as they were growing up. But many of these men were tremendous shepherds because the first thing he says is you need someone to have the qualities of a shepherd. Jesus said he had what? Compassion. One of the key elements that a shepherd need to have is compassion for people. Now I'm not going to get into some stuff because for those of you online and for those of us who are present, I suspect you know a lot of pastors a lot of shepherds. And they are different individuals 
you know, they, they, they do different things, you know. But if you're going to begin to evaluate, if God ever moves you to a different congregation, say it's not so, North Richmond. Yeah. <laughs> or he calls me home. It's not so. Well, I'm going one day, amen. <laughs> and you have to begin to evaluate shepherds, okay, individuals who you believe God is sending. You want to first see how compassionate they are. Yeah, amen. That's what it says. Amen. Look at the passage again. Mm -hmm. Jesus had compassion on them because they were wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. The implication is that a shepherd has compassion upon the sheep. The shepherd does not beat the sheep. For those who have had a study as it relates to Eastern uh, shepherding as opposed to Western shepherding, there's a difference. Many of us grew up watching cowboys and they will be on their horses with their dogs and from time to time there were sheep and they'd be behind and they'd be driving the sheep. A shepherd back then, even now, in Eastern culture will not drive the sheep. They are in front of the sheep. They are paying attention to what the environment is. They are trying to see if there's danger ahead. They don't drive them. They lead them. So, compassion is needed. We're going to go through some of the stories and, and some of the things that you know that you've heard in Scripture. And I want you to begin to understand the role of a shepherd. Because as much as I love being here, I have no guarantees how long God will keep me. Neither do you have any guarantees that you're going to stay. So if you get in a situation where you have to begin to look for a shepherd, a place that you feel God has sent someone to be the shepherd for you down here, you need to know what to look for. They need to be a man of compassion. Compassion. Okay? They won't drive the people. They will try to lead the people. Now, if you look at the cowboy movie, it's probably easier to drive folk than to lead them. Amen. Because when you drive them, you're forcing them to move. You're inflicting pain upon them if they don't move. Because when you drive sheep, you are concerned about the destination, you're not concerned about the sheep. So, compassion. Now, um, there's some other verses that talks about it, but I think we're going to just move into our major section, and that is the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. The Gospel of John the 10th chapter because I really want you to understand about a shepherd. I will agree that if, if you and I have to submit to someone, we want to make sure that's the right someone. Not a perfect person because he's up in heaven but someone who bears some of the qualities that Christ said was important as it relates to a shepherd. Um, John 10th chapter. And let us begin to read, and I will just be reading and giving commentary over what we read. Truly, truly, I say to you, those who does not, those, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Okay? Jesus says, they got to come in by the door. 
Okay. They have to be sent. Come in by the door. Back then, we'll see the shepherd, even at periods of time, was the door. Jesus says that. Now remember, this is reflecting on Jesus. This is a, um, a passage that talks about him shepherding us. But the qualities that he gives are the qualities that should be embodied in Ephesians 4 and 11. I gave some pastor teachers, some shepherd teachers. They come the right way. They don't try to what? Steal or rob. Okay? When you steal something, people don't know. When you rob something, somebody, they're looking at you. They don't try to take it by force. They don't try to be deceptive and get it. I want you to think about this. Okay. These are the qualities that he says should be in a shepherd. They don't want to take it by deceit. In other words, they don't want to make backroom, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A backroom plan to arrange them getting into that position. Oh, I'm sure some of us have heard about that. You know, backdoor discussions, how things are done under cover of darkness. They don't want to get it that way. Neither do they want a strong arm and come in and by force take over. It's not what they want to do. Okay, they come through the door. They are welcomed in. They come the right way. That's literally what it, he's trying to get us to understand. Let me keep reading. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Why? Because God is the one who's going to open the door. Book of, book, the book of Revelations, the church in Philadelphia, third chapter. Y'all remember? Some of y'all been with me long. Actually, all y'all here have been with me long enough to remember when we, we, when we were in the book of Revelation. Open the door. Nobody can close. God said, I'll open a door that no one can close. I'll shut a door they shouldn't go through. So... They come by the door, okay? To him the gatekeeper opens. Now, verse three, the sheep hear his voice. You see? Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now back then what took place that all the shepherds would be grazing their sheep out in the fields. When it got dark, they would take their sheep to an enclosure. It was a shared enclosure by all the shepherds. Okay. So you may have eight to ten shepherds there. Okay. And all the sheep would go in. Okay. And then the shepherds, when Jesus talked about out of the door, the shepherds would take turns, okay, laying at the entrance so that nothing could get in without them knowing. So you have a mixture of sheep, okay, and different shepherds. Mm -hmm. Then in the morning when it was time for them to leave to go back to graze again, okay, how does he put it? The sheep hear his voice. The shepherd would call out and his sheep, not the other sheep, would hear his voice. Amen. 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 Okay. They know the voice of their shepherd. Okay. Now, that relates to Jesus, but it also relates to down here. You should know who God has chosen to be your shepherd. Uh, um, I tell people all the time, and we, we live in some strange times, because some people, you know what they do? They church shop. They pastor shop. And they find one, okay, generally by superficial means. He may be tall, dark, and, <laughs> and handsome. He may have the gift of gab. 
He may have some other distinguishing elements and they say, oh, I want that individual. And they really don't know that individual at all. Like, like Saul. Go back and read Saul. The Bible says Saul was a head taller than all the rest of the men. He, and he was a handsome guy. And they said, oh, that must be our king. That must be our shepherd. So, the sheep hear the voice of their shepherd. Okay? They ain't trying to figure out, well, you know what? Today this shepherd sounds a whole lot better than, than my shepherd. So let me go with them today. And then they come back in and say, oh, next time there's another shepherd. Oh, I think I'm going to like that shepherd. Because that grain that he gave them was real good, et cetera, et cetera. The sheep hears the voice of their shepherd. Okay? It goes on to say, what, a stranger they will not, they will not hear. Now, let me tell you the beauty of that. And, and, and some people sometimes get a little concerned. The beauty of that is this. The people who are supposed to be in this congregation will be in this congregation because they will hear the voice of the shepherd God has given this congregation. And I, as the shepherd, shouldn't have to worry about them going to what? Another. Other congregations. Actually, if they leave and go to other congregations, it simply means this. I wasn't, I'm not their shepherd. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of folk, and I use North Richmond because we're here, but many of you who are online, you're not part of this congregation. I would simply say there's a lot of folk who wind up in churches that they should not be in. Just like there are pastors who are in churches they should not be in, there are sheep who are in churches they should not be in. Because you ought to know the voice of the shepherd that God has sent for you. And all his sheep have a shepherd. Amen. Why would God allow any of his sheep not to have a shepherd? This, this, the good shepherd, you know, you know this passage, the good shepherd. No, no, no. The good shepherd watches over all his sheep. So, just like the shepherd has to make sure that they are following the leading of God to be where they are supposed to be, the congregation has to make sure they are following the leading of God to be where they have to be. Because it should be someone that when you hear their voice, you respond to. Amen. If you're not responding, not the right shepherd. you're not listening to the right shepherd. Not right. Hmm. Okay. He hears the voice. Notice what else it says. Don't stop there. It says he calls his sheep by name. Now, now in today's, and this is why from time to time, I understand we have mega churches, okay? And when we realize that, you know, we have a pastor, but that is now called often a senior pastor, and there may be 10 or 12 or 15 under pastors under, okay? Because the idea is this, okay? There should be some personal interaction with those who shepherd you. Mm -hmm. Personal interaction. Time to time when I was young, I was saying, and I was dreaming, you know, you make these plans when you're young, and you say, Lord, okay, you want me to preach? This is what I want. <laughs> Amen. Okay. okay. I said, I have some educational pursuits, Lord. I, I want to do this. Now, now, God is a gracious God, and I think sometimes God just smiles at us. Uh -huh. <laughs> and say, oh, my child, you just don't know. But I, I, had some, I had some pursuits, some educational pursuits, and then I had some other requirements. I said, okay, 
I need to have a very large church with a tremendous staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And uh, God just smiled at me and said, okay. <laughs> and he taught me how those things that I thought were important mm -hmm. were not important at all. Not at all. Okay. What's important is the place where God puts you. That people hear my voice and I know who they are. We got to have some personal interaction. Let me simply say this to those of you who are in churches where you have no interaction with your pastor or your pastoral staff you are missing out Amen. on the blessing God has for your life. Amen. You're missing out. Because he places them there so that they can be for your benefit. That's what Hebrews 13 and 17 say. So it will be a blessing for you, not them. Now they do get blessed. I've been tremendously blessed. But hopefully the people who he have placed here under my tenure have been blessed because I have been here. They hear his voice and he knows their name. He has personal contact with them. And then it goes on to say what? It says, and he leads them out. You see that? Verse, we're still in verse 3. Yeah. And when, verse 4, when he has brought out all, out all of his own, all of his own, amen. Don't have to try to steal sheep from other, 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 other pastors. Okay. Sometimes that's the worst thing that can happen. He goes before them. And the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. I want you to get the personal relationship that is going on with the sheep. Now remember, this is about Jesus and us, but it's also about the pastoral staff and the congregations that God has left throughout the world. And I love it when he says he knows their name. You know the shepherd back then named his sheep, but we understand that because we name our Pets, don't we? Yeah. Don't we name our pets? Mm -hmm. well, it's a interaction. I never owned a cat. And for those of you who own a cat, may God bless you. <laughs> hey, I, I'm just saying. You know, I'm just saying. But I've I've owned I've owned one or two dogs. And my dog would be in the backyard or, you know, they get in the house every now and then, but when my dog was back out. But anyway, when I got home or was gone, when I, and I could be having a terrible day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I come into the presence of my dog and they are <laughs> excited yep. to okay. see me. That's why I say, I don't know about you cat owners. <laughs> but the dog, they're excited. Their tails start wagging and they start moving. They come up and if you get down on your knees, they'll just start licking on you. Personal interaction. That is what's supposed to be taking place with the shepherds that God leave with his people. And unfortunately, we're getting away from that. That's, that's one of the problems, and I understand we, we, we need to have the ability to communicate like streaming, where people can go online and pick because from time to time you get to a place and point where you can't get there, but there is a danger mm -hmm. in being detached mm -hmm. from the people of God, and there's a danger from being detached from the pastoral staff God leaves. There's a danger. He says, the shepherd leads him. 
once again, not driving them, but leads them. Okay? Now, I'm going to mix the 23rd Psalm in this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us know that. It goes on to say, and she followed him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Okay? So, I'm moving here and then I'm going to get to the 23rd Psalm in a minute. Let me drop down to verse number, I want to see if I want 11 or if I want to pull anything out of those other verses. Verse number 11. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Give his life. Sacrifice. Now, the chances of me dying for y'all probably will not have to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about it. I hope you're happy about it. Hope we, we don't we don't really live in a situation where I have to die for you physically, but I should die for you as it relates to sacrificially. There's some things that I must be willing. There's things that pastors sacrifice for the congregation God placed in. Pastors, they sacrifice. Now, many of us know that, and we can begin to start thinking about them. But just in case you can't think about some, let me give you some. <laughs> Oftentimes, okay, one of the first things they have to sacrifice is their time. Mm -hmm. They have to sacrifice their time. Now, I have come to realize I cannot be on call 24-7. But then I realize that I am on call 24-7. I realize that I cannot do what Jesus did, but I have to also be willing to realize that Jesus expects me to sacrifice, and time is of essence. Because to have the interaction connection that is needed, time must be given. You must give it collectively, you must give it individually. Time must be given. And for most members of a congregation, they want to spend some time with their pastoral staff. And if it's a church that's less than 200, you want to spend time with your pastor. You want him to be at some of your birthdays. You want him to be at some of your funerals. Amen. Think about it. Some of the weddings, some of the holidays, death bed, death bed mm -hmm. sickness. Mm -hmm. You want to know that your pastor is willing to sacrifice and be there. Amen. Okay? That doesn't happen every place. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's one, one of the things that this modern day world that we have began to see. So, you want him to be able to sacrifice some of his time. Now, more than likely, for most of them, okay, maybe not all of them, but for most of them, they're sacrificing something else, their finance. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some pastors, and thank you, that they can be taken care of real well. That's not the case with most pastors. Most pastors I knew and probably you knew it growing up, had to have what? A job. A job. And for those of us who've gotten away from the job where the church is taking care of us, we have come to understand that the church cannot take care of us at the level of our job could. So you have to sacrifice some finances. Okay? Now, when you sacrifice your time and you sacrifice your finance, if you're not careful, and pastors have done this, and this is something they shouldn't do, they will sacrifice their family. Because 
This puts a strain on the family, especially if it's a family where they have children mm -hmm. and he has to make decisions of doing something for somebody at the church who really needs him or going seeing his child play basketball, okay? Or his child play that instrument that they've been practicing so badly at the house. <laughs> 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 There's things that they would love to do, but they cannot always do. It's a sacrifice. Those are just three things. Quite naturally, there's others. So, he gives his life. Verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Okay. Now, let's move to the 23rd number of Psalms. We're not going to get into the teaching aspect. We're just going to stay with the pastor because time has moved right along. Many of us have read this song as we should have. Mm -hmm. And we realize that this song speaks of God because David starts it off by saying, The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. Now remember, who was David? Before he was king, he was what? A shepherd. He was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. Don't you find it ironic that he or the Holy Spirit, we should say, would choose this metaphor for David to use to give us probably the most well-known song and maybe the most well-known passage in Scripture. That God chose David, who was a shepherd, to use the metaphor of shepherding so the people of God would begin to understand what it is like for God to be their shepherd because David knew all there was to know about shepherding. So, and probably even those who do not spend time in a church and may not have stepped foot in it, some people nowadays, you know, which is quite amazing, have never been in church. That, that's that's mind-boggling for us. But there are people out there in this continental United States that have never stepped foot inside a church. Because you don't have to have a funeral or a wedding at a church. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know the passage. Sheep don't lie down unless two conditions are met. They will remain on their feet. They will not lie down unless, one, they are totally satisfied. They have been well fed. And then, like all of us who get well fed, <laughs> we lie down. <laughs> Let the church say amen. 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 That's what Sunday dinner was all about, right? <laughs> that we could be like sheep and could lie down because we were well fed. <coughs> they have to be well fed and they have to be free from the fear of danger. They are very skittish creatures. In other words, they have to feel they are in a place that is totally safe, an environment of peace. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, let's get that over to how it is seen by those of us today as we talk about a shepherd. That means the shepherd has to be engaged in feeding. And we're going to get to that next week. But he also has to make sure that the environment is what? Safe. Safe. Mm -hmm. Safe and 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 peaceful. Amen. Peaceful. Amen. When they come into the congregation, when they're getting engaged with the people, that they're safe, okay, but it's also a peaceful 
place. It talks about the still waters. Let me tell you about the waters, okay? Sheep will not drink from rushing water, like a river or a fast moving stream. They won't drink from that. The shepherd, and you remember the rod and the staff, he would take that and he would kind of dig out from the water, okay? And the water would run in and he would make a pool where the water was very still. still. And then they would drink because they would not drink from rushing water, okay? Peaceful. They lie down in peace. So, that is what the shepherd should be trying to create in the congregation where they're at. Peace. Amen. Amen. Peace. Safe from what is bombarding from the outside. We'll get to that as we, you know, you know, remember, know the story of David. Mm -hmm. Talk about the fact that what? Kill the lion, kill the bear. Okay. Because from time to time, <laughs> you got to destroy some things mm -hmm. that are trying to get to the sheep. Mm -hmm. But you got to have an atmosphere of peace. Okay? Trying to create an atmosphere of peace. Now, when we start moving through the 23rd Psalm, and we're going to pick it back up next week, we'll see some other things that relates to it. Okay, some things that some folks don't, don't really want to deal with. Okay. I'm just going to give you a little hint. Thy rod and thy... Okay, we'll get to it. But it should be an atmosphere of peace. You don't want the sheep, what? Warring against each other. You gotta create an atmosphere of peace. So, these are the qualities that God placed in his shepherds that he then give to his church so that they can then be, according to verse 12 in Ephesians 4, Okay, so they can be built up. So they can then go out and do what needs to be done as they are being fed and protected by the shepherd or the pastoral staff that God gives you. It's a gift. I have been extremely thankful And I've had, only had a few shepherds in my life growing up. And I've been extremely thankful, okay, especially of my pastor now. And y'all know who my pastor is. Okay. And pastors that I've had. Okay. Maybe not all of them. But most of the pastors who put into my life, I have been extremely thankful. Even now, there are some, I know I'm, I'm getting up in age, but there are some senior pastors who I can go to. And I know that what they tell me, whether I like it or don't like it, I know they're telling me because they love me. It's a gift that he gives to the people of God so that then they can go out and do the work of God and the church will begin to grow. Now, we're gonna stop right there. Amen. Any quick questions? Beautiful. Yes. I had a question when it was uh, related to, um, and the sheep knows, knows the shepherd's voice and a stranger that they will not follow. Is that saying that um, we shouldn't listen to other pastors like, you know, no. some of the famous, no, that's, like no that. not saying that, and I'm glad you brought that up, because let me explain this to, to, to those of us who are present. The gifts that you have, okay, these four gifts and the other gifts, they're not just for the particular congregation you are residing, residing in, they are for the body of Christ. Yeah. Your gift will function wherever the body of Christ is, okay? 
But the shepherds that he have given you, okay, those are the people that you should be listening to and gravitating towards. Mm -hmm. No, I, and you know, people say, hey, I heard such and such. Mm -hmm. Praise God, such and such is a gifted speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, gifted teacher. Read a book. Yeah, I like that book. I may not agree with none of them 100%, but I recognize that they have something good to say to the people of God. Actually, it's a danger, I feel, for you to only be exposed to one particular uh, uh, voice as it relates to the teaching of God's word. I believe that's a danger. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who should teach us. He can teach us from other places. Mm -hmm. I can learn from different groups of Christians mm -hmm. that I disagree with in many different areas. But they may have one or two areas that they do very well. I should sit and pay attention to. But the voice he's dealing with here is following after. Follow after. They lead you. Okay. They don't drive you. They got to drive you. <laughs> You're in the wrong place. In the wrong place. Uh -huh. Move on. Okay. <laughs> All right. If I have other questions, I'll pick them up because we're going to finish this next week. All right. Uh, thank you all so very much. Um, and to those of you online, we hope that it was a blessing. And hopefully I wanted to give people something to think about as it relates to your connection to the church that God has placed you in. So let me simply say thank you. And my prayer as always is that may God may richly bless you, my beloved. In Jesus' name we pray.